and I have good news for you. The Lord laid this on my heart 364 days ago. So you are in for a treat tonight. That's all I can say. Um, I would like to say thank you very much for the privilege of being a part of Bethesda. You guys have been um, so kind to come alongside. And I, uh, I remember that verse we used to say every missionette night. If you were missionettes, you know what it was. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And um, you guys have done that so wonderfully for us, and I, I really do appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for the privilege of looking at your word. I pray that God the Holy Spirit would anoint it to these who have been so faithful to come tonight. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us and help us to look to you for the answer to every problem in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, if I were to give you a title for you to hang this um, lesson on, um, I would probably call it The Best of Times and the Worst of Times. And if any of you are Charles Dickens fans, you know that's not original to me, but it was his famous opening line to A Tale of Two Cities. I'm not going to give you a literature lesson tonight, although I would dearly love to have a whiteboard and with this small group, I would love to move up and down the aisles, you know, and if you get to nodding off, touch you on the shoulder. <laughs> that's what, that's those teacher techniques to keep you awake, you know, without calling you out and saying, Emily, wake up, you know. Uh, it's just a, a little nicer way to do it. But I know you guys have had a, a long week. It's dark. It's cold. Everybody's um, ready to go home. So I'll try not to uh, preach the everlasting gospel. And you've heard some really great uh, perspectives on revival. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful that we have a pastor that lets the people be a part of sharing what they hear from the, from the Lord. And uh, the, the people who have spoken have done a tremendous job. And so... I, I can't reinvent the wheel or anything like that, but I, I wanted to share with you what the Lord put on my heart. Of course, like a good Bible student, I Googled the definition of revival uh, from a reliable site, okay? Um, and it, it gave me some characteristics, I think, that these have been covered uh, in, in different ways in the past weeks. A renewal of our love for God is revival, an appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for God's word and for his church, convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spirit of humility, and repentance and growth in righteousness. These are all facets of the diamond of revival, if you want to uh, call it that. Tonight, what I'd like to, to do is to look at one uh, point in time of the personal revival of probably one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, and that was Isaiah. So if you will turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, I'm going to read a lot of scriptures tonight, and there's two reasons for that. Um, the, the most important being that if I say nothing else, at least you will get something substantive because you will have heard the word, <laughs> and um, that is one of the main reasons. But in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, from the NIV, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. If you've gone to church for very long, you've heard this passage. It's a very, very um, familiar passage. And some of you are already a step ahead of me thinking, okay, is she going to talk about the exalted God that Isaiah saw in verses 1 through 4? Or uh, Isaiah's confession of his humility and his unworthiness that comes from verse 5. Or maybe you're thinking about verses 6 and 7 when Isaiah talks about his sanctification that he describes with the coal of fire touching his lips. All of that, these are signs of revival, right? You go to verse 8 and you hear God calling Isaiah and Isaiah responding. But I'm not going to talk about any of those things tonight. Um I'm going to take a little bit different directions. When, when I was doing my personal devotions, I wrote it in the, in the margin of my Bible, November 18th, 2020. Um, I was reading this passage, and as so many times, uh, those of you um, who've uh, read this, you know that this is like the swell of a symphony to the greatness of God. And to his sovereignty in calling Isaiah. And as you read this verse, your heart just kind of is lifted up. But what I found myself doing is reading it kind of like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, in music... You sometimes have a pickup note before you come to the downbeat of the first measure. And for me, those seven words in the year that King Uzziah died, I just kind of overlooked them. And until that day, and it was almost as if God the Holy Spirit got his remote control out like Roger does, pointed it at this scripture and rewound it back to the beginning of the first verse, and it said, he said to me, Shira, the details are important because I see Zach sitting back there, and he was a college student at one time, and some of the rest of you are, have been in school, and when you had an essay that had a 500-word minimum, you padded that thing for all it was worth, right? You'd go back in there and you look at the word count, and it was 473. So you go in and you put a few more adjectives in there and another prepositional phrase. And, you know, added it, not really in, extremely relevant, but, man, it got that word count up. But God the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. When he writes, when he, when he inspired the Bible, the details were, are important. So... He spoke to me and he said, Shira, in the year that King Uzziah died is important to this passage. And for that reason, I went back looking for King Uzziah. Now, you know that, that the, the kings of Israel are like an interwoven mess sometimes, trying to, to separate out. But I found King Uzziah. If you'll turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26 with me. Um, I want to jump into this quickly. Second Chronicles 26, verse 1. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. Now, uh, Uzziah and Azariah that we see in 2 Kings 15 is the same person. Uzziah was his throne name. Azariah was his personal name. And he was the king of the southern kingdom uh, of Judah from approximately 792 to 740 B.C. And his father Amaziah, you, say, you see that Uzziah was put into the throne 
in place of his father Amaziah. It does not say that Amaziah died. It says that Uzziah was put in to the throne in place of his father. And that's because his father Amaziah was a good guy to start out with. And then he adopted the idols. And so God sent the king of the northern kingdom down. The northern kingdom came down, destroyed 600 feet of the wall, stole the gold and the silver from the temple, pillaged the palace, and took hostages back to the north. And that's what Uzziah had as the environment in which his reign started. It couldn't go anywhere but up, right, from there. And so we see what happened. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you go to verse 2, Uzziah was the one who rebuilt Elith and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. And so things started to improve. Going down to verse 6. He went to war against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jabna, and Ashdod. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbel and against the Meunites. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah, and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. Man, he was opposing the enemies of Israel, and he was winning. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle of the wall, and he fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain. He had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Uzziah had a well-trained army ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers. Uh, skip down to verse 14. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made devices invented for use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that the soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls. His fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. And you're wondering, where is Isaiah in all of this? I'll tell you, most scholars believe that Isaiah was part of the royal court. He had a ringside seat to so many of these improvements. If Amaziah left Judah in a royal mess, that's a pretty good pun, I thought, the, um, then Uzziah, he brought it out of the, the depths of defeat. You look at it. They had peace with their enemies. Their economy was going up, up, up. They were sitting pretty. And I can almost see Isaiah having coffee with some of the, the other guys in the royal court saying, yes, we're back. And I don't know how long they were back. I don't know how long this good economy and flourishing society lasted. But if you look in verse 16, you see that conjunction that always indicates the contrast. In verse 16, it says, But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest, with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord, followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests 
the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense, leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Now, this is kind of bizarre to me. If you were the king, why in the name of heaven would you want to go to church and take the preacher's role? It doesn't make any sense. Until you look at the pagan nations that lived around Judah, and for them, the king was not just the king, but he was the priest. But God had clearly told the Israelites, the king is to be the king, the priest is to be the priest. And you know why? Because God had a plan, Carla. He had a plan that one day there would be a prophet, priest, king in the Messiah. And there was a reason why he said, no, we're going to separate these offices and so the priest tried to stop him, and Uzziah just persisted. And it got uglier in verse 19. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple. Leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, so they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. And you're looking at me thinking, this is a real downer. And it is. If we, if we continue to verse 22, there's, there's two more verses in this chapter, we see the connection between Second Chronicles and Isaiah. The other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by whom? The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried near them in the cemetery that belonged to the kings, for the people said he had leprosy, and Jotham his son succeeded him as king. And now you know why Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Isaiah wrote the biography of Uzziah. He knew all the good things that he'd done. 52 years, a lot of good things. He knew the bad things too. And I cannot imagine how devastated he was when his hero fell. His world was falling apart. It was, for Isaiah, the worst of times. And this meant especially a lot to me when I read this in 2020. But you know what? I think for many of us, the worst of times continue. If you look around horizontally, the worst of times are around us. But I think that it is so incredible when we see the juxtaposition of in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. It was the best of times, although everything around him was dark and despairing and disillusioning. It was the best of times for him to see the Lord. I really believe that he was placing the horizontal next to the vertical. He said, when confidence in the leader becomes disillusionment, God remains high and lifted up. When prosperity turns to presumption, the glory of God still fills the temple. When national security melts into fear, God's power still shakes the sanctuary. And when the best of times become the worst of times, God invites us to go and tell. I think if you're like me, the enemy, Jen, will whisper in your ear, listen, it's the worst of times. Don't bother with seeking God. There's no hope. Revival is a thing of the past. 
You're just stuck with where you are in God. But I have the good declaration from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that this is the best of times. Revival is not only corporate. Revival is individual. And it doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing. You can know revival in your heart. I was, I was uh, reminded by my sister, um, revival was a part of our lives so much growing up. Um, and this kind of sounds like a going to school in the snow, uphill both ways story. But we used to have two-week revivals and longer sometimes. And they were, we had three or four of them a year, you know. And in, in addition, we had 10 o'clock prayer meetings on the, de- on the days that we had revival. And they were just like a service that, that you needed to go to. Revival was so precious, but it is not over. Revival is not past. Because just like Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, in spite of troubles, we can still see the Lord high and lifted up. And there was an old song we used to sing it was entitled, Search Me, O God. And I wish I could sing and it, sing it for you, but you wouldn't be too impressed. Uh, depressed, probably, more likely. But these, this is the first and the last verse, and I want to close with this. I pray for you that in the year that King Uzziah dies, in your life, there will come a time. It always, there, it's a part of, of life when the darkness overshadows us to the point that we despair of life. And in those times, God is still there to revive our hearts, to give us a vision of who he is, and to give us a purpose to call us to a work, to a ministry. The hymn writer said, Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares thou wilt supply our need. For blessings now, O Lord, I humbly plead. It may be the worst of times for you. But in the worst of your times, God can still make it the best of times. And when you're reading these Old Testament dry stories, let your heart be encouraged. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we are so grateful tonight for the word of the Lord that continues to speak life to us in every generation. And Lord, I just pray that this word that God breathed will speak encouragement to each one of us, a challenge to our lives, Lord Jesus, that that we would finish strong in these last days because we do believe that you're about to send your son, Father. And we do believe that our time is short. We must work while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. And God, we still believe that the church is, is the hope of the world. It's the only hope this world has. And so may we, as the people of God, may may we not back away or may we not be intimidated by the hours in which we live but God may the spirit of the Lord breathe boldness into our own hearts God that we would declare the living word of God we know the natural tendency of a fire is to go out so Lord as we come around the altar of the Lord may we may we feed that fire that fire of desire, Lord, that belongs to us. That's that's our responsibility. So I pray, Lord, that here on the corner of 89th and May in Oklahoma City, this 
God, that we will give you our best, that we'll give our community our very best, that you'll entrust in our care eternal souls. Jesus, may, may we not be satisfied to seek out of town after dark when you come, for we are marching to Zion. Lord, you're coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And Lord, may we be ready for that call, but until you come, occupying, occupying. So I pray, Lord Jesus, for myself and for this family. Even though it seems as the worst of times, may we catch a fresh glimpse of who you are. In the year of the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That changes everything. So God, give us the desire to catch a fresh glimpse of your glory, your grace, your goodness. And let us not be satisfied with anything less, we pray. In Jesus' name. Would you stand together, please? And I want to just open the altars tonight. Just come and kneel and talk to the Lord, but more importantly, let him talk to you. Would you come, please, as we just spend some time? It's still early. Amen. Come on down. Let's find us a place. Build an altar somewhere in the house of the Lord.